Let's turn to a verse in Romans in chapter 14. One of the words that comes frequently in the Bible, Old and New Testament, is the word righteousness. It's very frequently found in the Old Testament. Righteousness, it speaks about the righteousness of the law. And now, uh, Paul says, uh, first of all, I'd like to show you Philippians 3 before we go to Romans. In Philippians 3, Paul says, I want to be found in God. That's Philippians 3 verse 9. I want to be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that righteousness which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So we here we read about Righteousness of the law and the righteousness of God. What is the difference? I mean, we can know the difference between sin and righteousness. That's understandable. We have a conscience that tells us what is sin. And the opposite of that is Righteousness. But there is a righteousness of the law and there is a righteousness of God. And we got to make sure that the righteousness we have is the righteousness from God. And Paul says, I don't want to be found. I want to be found in Christ not having a righteousness of the law. The righteousness of the law was quite a high standard. But he says, I don't want that. But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Now it's very easy to misunderstand this. The righteousness of the law was something which man struggled to keep God's law. And nobody attained to it. In the entire history of Israel, nobody could come to that righteousness which is uh, from to, to God's standard. And that is why it was abolished. Anyone the Bible says if anyone tries to be accepted by God on the basis of the law, he's cursed. So the first thing God does for us when he forgives our sin is to make Christ our righteousness. Otherwise I can't be accepted before God. You know, many people think that if my past sins are forgiven, it's over. All my past sins are forgiven and I can be accepted by for God. No. Even the angels in heaven, Isaiah saw them covering their face and covering their eyes and feet because the holiness of God is so intense that they could not look at him. So we need to understand what it means that not only I'm for my sins are forgiven, but that I am justified. Many Christians have not understood the importance of being justified. Sins are forgiven. Okay, you confess your sins, you are absolutely sure. God says, I will not remember your past sin anymore. But on that basis, I cannot come before God, even if all your sins are forgiven. You cannot come before God. 
you have to have Christ as your righteousness. So the Bible says Christ has made to us righteousness and that is what it means to be justified. That is why God declares us righteous, not just forgiven. If our past sins are forgiven, God declares us forgiven. But he declares us righteous. And one of the ways I have illustrated it is, if you are taken to court and accused of a lot of crimes and uh, the judge acknowledges that you have committed all those crimes but you are forgiven and you come out happy but all the people outside know you are a criminal but you are a criminal who has been forgiven a sinner who has been forgiven that's good. But on the other hand, if the judge says, this man has not committed anything wrong, because all these charges are false, there's nothing to it, then you come out with your head lifted up. Otherwise you come out being down, yeah, I'm a criminal, but the judge was merciful, I was forgiven. But if the judge declares, imposing the judge says, I've examined all the charges against this person and they are all false. He's a totally righteous person. Then you come out with your head lifted up. I find that many Christians, their head is hanging down. They're always sort of gloomy, discouraged, there doesn't seem to be much happiness and joy in their life. Like one of these gloomy Christians once went to witness to somebody, you know, we are told to witness to others about Christ. So he want, went to this person, this gloomy looking Christian and said, I want to tell you about Jesus Christ. He said, that man said, no thank you, I've got already enough problems. I don't want to have the problem, it will make me look like you. That's a pathetic witness when I go with a gloomy face to somebody to tell him about Christ. But lots and lots of Christians have got a very gloomy appearance. And they think that is holiness to always feel miserable about my sin. And, uh, but haven't you confessed it? Yeah, it's confessed. Is it forgiven? It's forgiven. Then why are you so gloomy? Because you have not seen Christ as your righteousness. You don't have the boldness that comes that Christ is my righteousness. I'm clothed with a garment from heaven. So that the righteousness of the law does not bring us to that place. Now, now we turn to Romans chapter 14. You know, we are told to seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. Jesus said that. Seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. And then the other things will be added to us. So, what is the kingdom of God and is there too much of an echo here? Can I put this a little away? Can you hear me at the back? Yes or no? What about, what about now? You can't hear me? Can you hear me? Anytime you can't hear me, just raise your hand. Because I think it's too close and it's too much of an echo. Okay. Uh, so, what is the kingdom of God and his righteousness? In Romans 14 verse 17, it says, the kingdom of God, here's a definition of the kingdom of God. My guess is, 90% of Christians have got no idea what Jesus meant when he said kingdom of God. They think it is doing missionary work or going out and preaching the gospel. I don't know if, how, if somebody were to ask you, what does it mean to seek the kingdom of God first? 
what would you tell him you probably tell him that spread the gospel or something like that but here it says the kingdom of god is not eating and drinking but righteousness and peace and joy in the holy spirit that shows us the difference between the righteousness of the law and the righteousness of god and it's very easy to find out which righteousness you have got in the righteousness of the law there is no joy in the holy spirit it's a gloomy type of righteousness always serious long faced struggling to try and please god and i've seen lots of people in cfc churches like that every time you see them they they're so serious and gloomy that nobody's attracted to christ by looking at their faces you ask yourself you know when people live with you in your office and all do they feel attracted to christ by what they see in you they should but if they see a gloomy long faced person who's always trying to be holy you're not going to attract a single person to Christ it's a good question to ask yourself how many people do you think are drawn to Christ by seeing you in your place of work you've been working in your place for maybe 10 years not a single person was attracted to Christ by your life don't you think there's something seriously wrong with that are you quite content even if i work in this office for 30 years i know nobody will be attracted to christ but you say brother what to do they are not interested no the reason could be that they don't see the righteousness of god in you which has got a joy in the holy spirit the kingdom of god is righteousness peace and joy in the holy spirit the righteousness without joy is a righteousness of the law and such people are very legalistic also they are very judgmental of other people who they feel are not measuring up to this standard the pharisees were they had such a righteousness it was a gloomy type of righteousness and they were very judgmental of others and i want to say honestly there are a number of people like that in cfc churches they have not understood the difference between the righteousness of the law which paul said i don't want it i don't want the righteousness of the law i want the righteousness of god because the righteousness of the law is the old testament the new covenant righteousness is righteousness and peace and joy in the holy spirit now joy doesn't mean they're always smiling smiling is different from joy there are a lot of people in the world who smile and laugh i never read in the bible that jesus smiled or laughed i mean i'm sure he did but that was not the characteristic of his life that he was always smiling and laughing but he always always had joy even towards the end of his life he said to his disciples in roman john 14 my joy i give unto you not as the world gives turn with me to john's gospel and chapter 15 john 15 uh jesus said these things uh, verse 11 these things have i spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full so when is he saying this he's saying this about what's it about 12 hours before he's going to be crucified this is 9 o'clock at night and next morning 9 o'clock he's going to be crucified and at 9 o'clock at night 12 hours before he's going to be crucified i mean imagine if you're going to be hanged tomorrow morning 
uh, as a criminal and today you go around encouraging people saying i'd like to share my joy with you that's what we see here he wasn't laughing and smiling all the time but he was full of joy even though he knew he was going to be killed tomorrow morning there was a joy in jesus life which i'm sure was evident on his face and i believe it is something we have to pursue i don't want to spend all my life having a gloomy old testament righteousness that i don't do this and i don't do that and i don't do the other thing um and i think i'm very holy if my holiness is purely negative negative i don't go to the cinemas i don't watch dirty movies i don't tell lies i don't drink i don't smoke i don't gamble and i don't even lose my temper i'm a holy person what is your holiness i don't do this i don't do this i don't do this i don't do this other things that's not holiness that's a very negative type of holiness but you can ask yourself what do you do do you have joy in the holy spirit you know the lord told you know that passage in one kings and uh, the time of elijah when elijah was hiding in a cave uh, and he said lord i alone am left and the lord said no there are 7000 people in israel who have not bowed the knee to baal baal so 7000 people who all of israel was worshiping idols baal ahab was the king but there were 7000 people who did not bow the knee to baal so that testimony listen carefully was a negative testimony what is your testimony brother i have not bowed the knee to baal it's like saying i don't do this i don't do this i don't do this i don't bow the knee to baal i don't do i don't it's a negative testimony the testimony of elijah was in 1 king 17:1 i stand before the lord as the lord liveth before whom i stand it was a positive testimony not i don't bow down to idols but i stand before jehovah and all those 7000 people combined could not bring the fire down from heaven no they only had a testimony i don't bow down to idols they could never bring the fire down and show the nation of israel who is the true god and what i learned from that is if my testimony is only negative i don't do this i don't do that i don't do the other thing i don't lust after women now i don't get angry i don't tell lies i don't do this i don't do this i don't do the other thing and i have this gloomy type of righteousness no i'll never be able to bring the fire down from heaven anywhere not on my life or anybody else's life not in my home nowhere elijah who said i'll stand before god He had a positive testimony he could bring the fire down one man could do what 7000 people could not do so what i'm trying to say is that one man who is filled with the holy spirit and the joy of the holy spirit can accomplish more than 7000 people who are avoiding all types of things and who who think they are righteous because they avoid so many evil things in the world So Paul says I don't want the righteousness of the law which just keeps me away from a lot of evil things. I want the righteousness of God which is a positive thing. A righteousness which is and one mark of it is joy in the holy spirit. Now the question is how often should I have this righteousness? All the time. I must always be have the righteousness of God which is in other words I must always have joy in the holy spirit. it doesn't mean i'll be smiling all the time no not at all i don't believe jesus was smiling all the time if you see a man walking down the road smiling all the time you know the guy is off his head he is crazy he should be in a lunatic asylum that's not the way god wants us to live but joy is different from smiling all the time joy is different from laughing all the time if you find a man laughing all the time he belongs in the lunatic asylum too 
But joy is different. It's different from smiling and laughing. It's different from cracking jokes and appearing to be a funny person. No. Joy is a deep inward thing that I know. A person who is full of joy is never discouraged. Not because he's perfect. Nobody's perfect. But he's never discouraged. He doesn't condemn himself. That is, the, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So I'll never get it if I don't seek it first in my life. So if I don't have this righteousness which is full of the joy of the Holy Spirit, there must be only one reason. And the reason is that's not what I'm seeking first in my life. There may be other things I'm seeking in my life. Maybe to have a good testimony in the church. That I don't do this and I don't do this and I don't do the other thing and I don't do the other thing. And I'll tell you, in most churches you can have a very good testimony. If you avoid all these sinful things and they say, here's an upright brother or sister. They don't do this, they don't do this, they don't do the other thing. And some of these self-righteous Pharisees can be quite proud of the fact that I never lose my temper at home. That's also a negative testimony. It's a very good thing that I never get angry at home. Good. But it's it's still a negative testimony. It's the testimony of a self-righteous Pharisee. See, for example, I've used this illustration. Supposing one day your wife is really upset and she gets angry and yells at you. And you are calm and you're peaceful. And then she goes away and inwardly you say, Lord, I thank you. I'm not like my wife. I didn't lose my temper. Whose language is that? Does it remind you of a parable Jesus said? Of a person who spoke like that? It's a Pharisee. Lord, I thank you. I'm not like other people. I don't lose my temper. That's a Pharisee. But it doesn't look like a Pharisee. You think you're following the CFC standard of righteousness. Not at all. And that poor wife of yours who lost her temper may afterwards repent and go before God and ask forgiveness. And at the end of the day, she is accepted. And you're rejected. Because you're a self-righteous Pharisee. Even though you're the one who didn't lose your temper. And she's the one who lost her temper. We're going to get a lot of surprises in the day of judgment. I'll tell you. There's self-righteous Pharisees who glory in the fact that I don't do this and I don't do that. Christ is not in their life. A person who's got the righteousness of God, I'll tell you one thing. He can never ever even think. I thank God I'm not like other people. It's one mark of a genuine Christian. The moment you begin to think, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like people in other churches. Something is wrong. A person who's righteous in God's eyes is not conscious of his righteousness. It's like, you know, we ask, who is a truly humble person? Well, it may be very difficult to define who is a truly humble person, but one one proof is that he's not aware of his humility. That's for sure. If a person is aware of his humility, you can be pretty sure that fellow is not humble. So if you want to know whether you're humble or not, here's one test. Are you very aware of your humility? Then you're definitely not humble. So, there are so, so many things we have to be aware of particularly self-righteousness. It's one of the biggest problems in in Christendom, particularly those who pursue holiness. The greatest danger, I've often said that the greatest danger in CFC is not sin. It is hypocrisy and self-righteousness. It is people who are, who are not pure in their private life pretending to be holy, sitting in the, bunch of, in the midst of a bunch of holy people. That's one. And the second is feeling self-righteous and looking down on others who you feel are not as holy as you are. These are the biggest dangers in CFC. The the danger in CFC is not murder and adultery and pornography and all that. Maybe people indulging in that in secret, but that's not the biggest danger. 
The biggest danger is this righteousness of the law. And I must steer clear of it. Paul says, I never want to be found with the righteousness of the law, which will make me look down on other believers, or look down on people in other churches, or look down on my wife, or look down on my husband, or satisfy myself that I'm not doing this, and I'm not doing this, I'm not doing the other thing. And the test is, do you have the joy of the Holy Spirit? And the peace of the Holy Spirit. So, it's a very important verse, Romans 14, 17. Seek first the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is righteousness, Peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If I keep that always before me, I say, Lord, that's where I want to live. I always want to live with this righteousness which is coupled with peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So joy is a very, very important part of genuine righteousness. A righteousness without joy is not the righteousness of God. And even though the, right, the righteousness of the New Testament is not something that will make us smile and laugh. But a person who is joyful will not be going around with a long gloomy face all the time. There will be, there'll be something in his life you know, which draws you. I like to be with joyful people. To tell you honestly, I don't like to be with gloomy people. I don't like to be with serious, long-faced people because it's discouraging. So, please keep this in mind. And the other thing here is, it is righteousness with peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's not just joy. So, peace is another very good test of whether I have righteousness. In the Old Testament, as I said, peace and joy were missing. And that's how we know it's the righteousness of the law. But when Paul says, I want the righteousness, I don't want the righteousness of the law. The test is, do I have peace and joy? No, then it's the righteousness of the law. I don't want that. I want the righteousness which is from God, which is always accompanied by peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So this is a very, very important aspect of the righteousness which is from God. And I want to show you two verses connected with that. One is Colossians in chapter 3. Colossians in chapter 3 uh, Colossians chapter 3 we read in verse 15 Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which you are called in one body and be thankful. In the margin of my Bible it says let the peace of Christ be the referee in your heart. You know what a referee is in a football game? When a referee blows the whistle you have to stop the game. You cannot kick a, the ball. Even if you kick it into the goal, it will not be counted because a foul has been committed and the referee blew the whistle. You've got to bring the ball to that spot where the foul was committed. Set that right, then only the game will continue. So it says the peace of Christ is a referee in our heart telling us a foul has been committed. Stop the game. Stop whatever you are doing and set that foul right. So what I get from that is that anytime I lose the peace of Christ in my heart, if I lose the peace of Christ, that means that the referee has blown his whistle. It's a very good test. Anytime. Please keep this. Take this seriously. The kingdom of God is righteousness and joy and peace. In the Holy Spirit. So anytime in your life you find somehow the peace is gone. There's a little unrest in your heart and the peace of Christ is gone. It's a referee blowing the whistle saying something is wrong in your life. That something may be that 
you suddenly you suddenly or you have a bad attitude towards somebody that's enough to destroy the peace or you are suddenly worried and anxious about something which is quite unnecessary because you got a loving father in heaven the peace is gone or you are very agitated in your mind about something somebody else did which disturbed you maybe something your wife or husband did at home and is disturbing you at that moment you don't have peace it's a referee blowing a whistle loudly saying stop the game stop the game means stop doing other things and set this right then proceed but most of the time most christians don't bother to listen to the referee's whistle they don't bother they continue they go keep on kicking the ball into the goal and nothing is going to be counted stop go before god and say lord what is wrong there is something which is disturbing the peace in my heart i want to set it right before i proceed further in my life i mean i follow that rule in my life i've always told people if you have lost the peace in your heart and you're agitated that is the time when you must keep your mouth shut don't open your mouth when you're agitated in your heart because definitely sin will come from your mouth but you can keep from sinning with your mouth if you follow a simple rule that when i'm agitated in my heart i will not open my mouth whether at home or in the office or anywhere even in a meeting i say if you're asked to speak in a meeting even for 5 minutes and you're agitated in your heart just tell the brother brother i don't want to speak to you you're not fit to speak i've been in situations where i've uh, you know i've gone to the meeting and i've been disturbed by some some something that some brother was supposed to do in the meeting and he didn't do it and because he didn't do it there was some type of problem so i i remember once this happened in a wednesday meeting and i, I you know before the meeting we always have a time of prayer and i found that we normally pray only 10 15 minutes and i found that i hadn't come to rest in my heart about this thing that was disturbing me about something in the meeting that was not done properly and i said i have to come to rest otherwise i can't get up and speak in this meeting so i said what to do we just we were kneeling down and we kept on praying i said i'm not going to get up from my knees till i come to rest without coming to rest if i get up to speak i'm not going to speak in the holy spirit i'll be speaking with my own spirit disturbing uh what i'm saying is something wrong with this not working you want both of them don't cause a problem this is like these meetings where important people speak and you have so many mics in front of you okay <clears throat> so what i did was i kept on praying and it went on for 45 minutes when i came to rest in my heart then i got up because i have a law in my life i will never speak in a meeting or anywhere if there is the slightest agitation in my heart because i will sin definitely because the referee is blown the whistle how do i know the foul has been set right i know the foul has been set right when the peace has come back to my heart i want to tell all of you you follow this simple rule you'll have a lot more peace at home a lot more peace in your life and life will be much happier so the righteousness of god is always something accompanied by joy and peace in the holy spirit another verse is romans chapter 
which we need to also bear in mind. There are many people who say, how can I know what the will of God is in a particular situation? How can I know whether this is the will of God or that is the will of God as I consider two different uh, possible things that I should do. Should I do this or should I do that and I'm not very sure. Then here is a verse, Romans 8 verse 6. The mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. So the way I can know that my mind is set on the Holy Spirit is again by peace. When I'm considering a course of action, should I take this job or that job? Should I marry this person or that person? The answer always is by peace in your mind. The Holy Spirit, the mind of the Spirit is always known by peace. If you feel at unrest when you consider a course of action, you can be sure that that is not the will of God for you. Because today God doesn't speak from outside like he spoke to Abraham and Samuel and the prophets with sometimes a voice from heaven. Because today God has come to dwell inside us through the Holy Spirit. And that's why we don't hear God speaking from the outside. He's not outside us, he's inside. And from inside he speaks to us by a mind that is at peace. The mind of the Spirit is peace. It's a very helpful way to know when you're considering a course of action and you think of two or three possible courses of action, that which gives you most peace in your mind is the way you know the will of God. So anything when you pray about something or you think about something and it's producing a lot of agitation, then you know that that's not the mind of the Spirit. The mind of the Spirit is always known by peace. So this is not something in the Old Testament. Jesus spoke a lot about it. He said, My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. Let not your heart be troubled. So these are the ways by which we can know that our righteousness is the righteousness given by the Holy Spirit. A righteousness which has come from God and not something which is just by my satisfying myself that I have avoided certain evils and I don't do this and I don't do that and I'm trying my best to please God. Turn with me now to Romans in chapter 5. In Romans in chapter 5 we read these words. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Having been justified, and justified means declared righteous. That's the meaning of justified, in case you did not know it. It means Almighty God has declared you to be righteous by faith. Again, it's the same thing. If you have been declared righteous by God, you have peace in your heart with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, I don't know whether all of you see the importance of a life where we always have peace and joy in our spirit. That is the will of God for you. There must never be a time when I've lost my peace or lost my joy. If I did, I must do what the, they do in the football game. What do they do in the football game when the referee blows the whistle? Stop everything put that ball back in the place where the foul was committed and set it right and then continue with the game. So I wonder whether we do that, that whenever I've lost my joy or peace, you take a few moments and it doesn't take long to seek the Lord. Even in the middle of your work, you can say, Lord, I just want to wonder why this is happening. Why am I at unrest? And if you can't find a quiet spot in your desk in your office, go go to the restroom and sit there for two minutes and say, Lord, I want to come to rest. 
in my spirit. I don't want to proceed like this. And where it becomes a habit in your life that you never will proceed in your life if you find the referee has blown a whistle. And if you will follow this rule from today, you will find a tremendous difference in your Christian life. Be a tremendous difference in your home life. A tremendous difference in your whole way of life. If you follow this simple rule that I will not leave unrest in my heart for any length of time. I'll immediately try to set it right at the earliest possible opportunity. Sometimes it does. All you have to do is go and ask somebody's forgiveness. See if you have hurt somebody. Uh, peace will not come by just praying. I've heard of I've heard some Pentecostal people say how they had a fight with their wife and then they went alone with God and had a time of prayer and spoke in tongues and uh, everything was okay. Well, I say everything was not okay. The devil just fooled you. Because you cannot be okay if you've had a fight with somebody and you haven't settled it. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, uh, he's talking about anger, where you get angry with somebody. In verse 22, if you're angry with your brother, and oh, it could be your wife or your husband or somebody you got angry with, you'll be guilty. And then if you said something to that person, you'll be more guilty. And if you said something more to hurt that person, then you're guilty enough to go to hell. So therefore, the context is the same thing. You have hurt somebody with your words. Therefore, therefore means it's based on verse 22. When you come before God to present your prayer and there you remember that this person you hurt is over there, maybe in your house. Go first and be reconciled to your husband or wife or whoever it is. And then come and present your offering. Very, very important. You come and otherwise God is not going to accept it. You can pray all night. God won't accept it. If there's something in your heart unsettled with somebody, it could be somebody you haven't forgiven or somebody you need to ask forgiveness from. Unsettled. Any amount of prayer is a waste of time. And that's why I believe that a lot of prayers that Christians pray I say God doesn't even pick up the telephone what are you speaking you're wasting your time speaking God hasn't even picked up the phone he's not listening he's not listening because there's something unsettled in your heart with another brother or with your wife or husband or somebody you have not forgiven that is the, the referee has blown a whistle and the best thing to do is to stop everything and uh, settle that matter with God and then proceed. So in Romans 5, it says, God, we are declared righteous by God and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes on to say, <clears throat> about the grace of God in that chapter, Romans in chapter 5, in, if you go towards the end of that chapter, he's comparing the law with grace in Romans 5 and verse 20. When the law came, transgression increased. That means you only became aware of sin. But when sin increased, grace abounded more than sin. That's another verse that teaches us that grace is more powerful than sin. Where sin abounded, increased, grace abounded the more. That means there is no sin that can come into your life where God's grace cannot be more than that to conquer it. Don't ever look at a sin and say, I can't conquer that. Even when sin increases in your life, grace should increase above that. But you must have faith that God will give me grace to overcome that sin. That I can come to peace in this situation without being 
in unrest. But we have to ask for it. It says in Hebrews in chapter 4 about this grace. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse, you know, the well-known verse that we quote often in CFC, Hebrews 4.15. Jesus was tempted in every point as we are and yet without sin. And the reason he was without sin was because the grace of God was upon him. So therefore, what should we do? Therefore, in verse 16. Whenever you see a word therefore in scripture, you must try and find out why that word there, therefore is there. What, it is, what is it there for? Therefore, let us now go to God and ask for grace to help me, verse 16, in the time of my need. So what is the truth that we derive from the fact that Jesus was tempted like me and did not sin. Is it just a truth I must believe? Jesus was tempted like me and did not sin. What should I do? Therefore, let us also go to the throne of grace that we can receive the same grace that Jesus got in his time of temptation so that we don't sin. That's the meaning of the last part of verse 16. Let us therefore go to God and ask for that grace to help me in my time of need when I am tempted. And if I do that, I will live a life where I am constantly having the peace and joy of the Holy Spirit.